the core of the sun. This is a soup of electrons and protons we call plasma, where the former would normally orbit the latter. In this case, billions and billions of them move freely around in a dense, hot climate. And we aren't talking desert hot. Try 15 million degrees Celsius. And it's important because temperatures and pressures this high allow free roaming protons to reach a critical speed. You see, protons are positively charged and as such naturally repel each other thanks to the column force. That's also called the electromagnetic force. Think of identical magnetic poles being squished together, right? There's a repelling force there. And it's the same principle with protons, but when trillions of PSI and millions of degrees Celsius are mixed in, protons smash into each other by managing to overcome the column force, instead succumbing to the nuclear force. In stars around the size of our sun, this proton-proton collision ultimately drives the fusion process that warms our planet. When one proton smashes into another, a few things happen. First, one of the protons in the new deuterium nucleus becomes a neutron. This is actually a rare event. Typically, the two fused protons just decay back into separate particles without anything else happening. But enough deuterium is produced every second to sustain the chain reaction inside our star. And we'll assume that's what's happening here. So at this point, two smaller particles are yielded, a positron and a neutrino, in a process called beta plus decay. The previously positive charge of the converted neutron is transferred to the smaller positron, which is an electron with a positive charge instead of a negative one. The other particle, a neutrino, is an electron with no charge at all. The positron will almost immediately collide with an electron, yielding two gamma rays, which are hypercharged light particles. Gamma rays are the things that cause cancer by penetrating and breaking down cellular DNA. That's bad. As for the neutrinos, well, you're being bombarded with billions of those every second, but they rarely interact with nature, so you don't have to worry. They're very small and they are neutral hence the name neutrino. Now back to our deuteron, within seconds it fuses with another proton creating helium-3 or helion. A gamma ray is also released with a significantly higher energy state than the previous reaction. And at this point, helium-3 must become helium-4 somehow. So yeah, it gets dicey. The problem is that there are several ways to make helium-4, so we'll discuss the two most common methods. Method one involves two helion nuclei. As long as temperatures are somewhere in the range of 10 to 12 million Kelvin, they're able to smash into each other and yield helium-4, along with two protons and a ton of energy. The process takes around half a millennium to play out most of the time, which is kind of hard to fathom, and that's because a single proton will typically smash into helion and then decay immediately again. That disrupts the process between two helion atoms, and there are way more protons inside the sun than there are helion or helium atoms. So then, helium-4 will go on to fuse with other smaller nuclei to form heavier elements like beryllium, carbon, and oxygen. But when temperatures are much hotter, method two becomes rather common. It involves a collision of one helium-3 nucleus, that's helion, and one helium-4 nucleus, forming beryllium-7. Beryllium-7 is interesting because it appears stable on paper. There are the same number of electrons as there are protons, but the proximities of its four protons result in something called electron capture, in which case an inner shell or free roaming electron, especially in the case of plasma and the sun, is absorbed into the nucleus, releasing a neutrino and accompanying energy. The resulting nucleus is thus comprised of four neutrons and three protons, transforming beryllium-7 into lithium-7, which is significantly more stable. Now, a free roaming proton, which there are plenty of inside the sun, may collide with a lithium nucleus to produce beryllium once again in a process called lithium burning, only this time with an extra neutron tucked into the nucleus. Beryllium-8, the resultant, is extremely unstable and almost immediately decays into two helium-4 nuclei coincidentally. And there we go, we ended at the same place as method one, only with twice as much helium as the former. By the way, I wrote this script at 2 a.m. on a Sunday, so you'll have to excuse the more particular details I've glossed over, and this is a five or so minute video after all, so please be gentle with me. Thanks for the curiosity, thanks for watching, and thanks for learning with us.